when, when we fall prey to that kind of mindset, we'll soon discover that your focus does, in fact, determine your direction. Uh, if you spend most of your time trying to manage your sin, then your sin consciousness will eventually be your own downfall. Glad you've joined us for another broadcast. We're excited about what we're going to share today with you. Thanks for all of you who have subscribed to the channel uh, and shared these videos with your friends and given us thumbs up and, um, you know, push that notification bell. And, and for those of you who have uh, donated to help underwrite the, the costs of producing videos like these, thank you so much. Our discussion for today is a really big one and uh, an important mindset shift that has really huge spiritual implications. Unfortunately, I think many people kind of fail to realize the significance of the two different focuses that we're going to talk about, uh, that we're going to be discussing. These focuses are known as sin consciousness and Christ consciousness. So Don, maybe you can uh, kind of begin by explaining the difference between those two. Be happy to. Um, I kind of would start by asking a question. Whom or what is your focus? You know, focus makes a huge difference. And, you know, we're all focused on something, whether we're even consciously aware of it or not. A lot of times we're subconsciously focused on things. And, you know, there's that kind of that undertow that kind of those of us who live on the coast here on the Atlantic Ocean, you know, that kind of that rip current that kind of affects our mood and our emotions and such. And so what I found in working with people over 30, 40 years now in counseling is that many Christians are overly concerned and frankly focused on sin, uh, both their past sin and their present struggles with sin. And because of such, they've tended to believe that their Christian life and, you know, whether or not their Christian life is what it should be, uh, it, it tends to focus consciously or, or subconsciously on performance, whether or not they're measuring up to God, whether or not they believe that they have the approval of God, whether they're right with God. And as a result, because of this sin consciousness, they become consumed by all that negative, sinful thought life that, you know, obviously we're all bombarded at various times throughout the day with negative thoughts, with sinful thoughts. And if, if, our, if our concept of ourselves and our relationship with God is sin-focused and, you know, all the time trying to combat that or uh, to resist that, then it just tends to lead to sinful behavior because we find ourselves not only uh, fearing that we're failing God by sins of omission or commission, but what we may, may not have recognized is that our primary motivation is not to sin. Well, once again, that tends to lead to a daily evaluation as to how well we're doing, whether or not we're measuring up to God's standards of perfection. And so you can see, as we're talking about this, that that sin-driven mentality uh, becomes kind of a miserable and vicious cycle. And, and I see it over and over again. I lived it for many years, <laughs> can relate to it, where, you know, it, it's the cycle of sin avoidance, Sometimes sin cover up, you know, I don't want to admit what I'm struggling with and acknowledge it because, you know, I'm not supposed to be sinning and maybe I'm struggling with sin, so I try to pretend I'm not. Or then I just acknowledge it and then I'm confessing it all the time. So, so what happens is there's this, this overall consciousness of sin. And the end result ends up with guilt, 
shame, uh, confusion, uh, just not feeling like we are who we should be. And so essentially sin consciousness keeps us focused on ourselves, on our progress, on our spirituality, on our needs, you know, me, me, me. And so the, the Christian who lives this way inevitably continues to eat at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can trace this all the way back to, to Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, where, this, where, where the Christian that's struggling with this conscious, sin conscious awareness, uh, they're falsely assuming a responsibility for living the Christian life and doing so by avoiding sin, trying to be like God, Genesis 3 5, as the serpent suggested to Eve. And so when, when we fall prey to that kind of mindset, we'll soon discover that your focus does, in fact, determine your direction. Uh, if you spend most of your time trying to manage your sin, then your sin consciousness will eventually be your own downfall. Mm. Now, that's just one side. We haven't really talked about a Christ-conscious awareness, but that's the sin-conscious awareness that we can compare Christ-consciousness to. Yeah, I think that's huge, Don. You know, I've found this to be very true uh, personally in my own experience and certainly in the experiences that I've kind of participated um, with or heard about from people that I've uh, pastored over the years. And I once heard an analogy uh, of this reference to a house fire, which I think is kind of applicable to what we're talking about. And uh, basically, it's, it's kind of like if you could imagine uh, a big fire that's happening in your kitchen, right? And so you think you start talking about the fire and then you, you, you're thinking about the fire, you're looking at the fire. Maybe you go and you tell someone, hey, my kitchen's on fire. And during that whole time, like you might even get a whole bunch of people and say, hey, I have a problem with this fire in my kitchen, right? And this whole time, what are you not doing? You're not yeah. putting out the fire. Yeah. And so like, it doesn't make any sense when we think about it in that context, mm -hmm. right? But when it comes to actually dealing with our sin, there just seems to be this kind of disconnect where we think if we focus on the problem, then somehow we're gonna solve it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's so often the issue, especially with habitual sins and, and problems that people may struggle with, they focus so much on the sin and on the issue rather than the solution, which is, I believe, where, uh, where we're getting to uh, here, here in a minute. So, Don, why do you think so many Christians struggle with this, and how has our performance-based culture kind of played into this issue? Well, I, honestly, it's this, this faulty view of sin management that so many have adapted. And when you stop and think about sin management, uh, that's a religious paradigm. And it's driven by performance-based acceptance. In other words, we've assumed responsibility to live the Christian life, which is really impossible. There's only one person that ever did, and that was Christ. And obviously, he's come to be our life and to live it through us as we walk by faith and relationally participate with him. And yet, tragically, many a Christian is kind of unaware that the victory has already been won, that their sin has already been dealt with. It's been literally taken out of the way. And so sin consciousness, I would refer to it as religious quicksand. You know, the more we're struggling to get out of this this quicksand, the more we find ourselves sinking and, you know, being succumbed by it. And so it's the endless, futile struggle to conquer sin by one's own self-efforts to overcome, frankly, what's already been overcome by the overcomer himself, Jesus Christ. So the good news of the gospel is that the sin of mankind, your sin, my sin, has been taken care of at the cross when Jesus defeated the satanic originator 
who is the source of sin. Uh, look up 1 John 3.8. You are not the source of sin, contrary to what you believed. And so when Jesus took care of sin at the cross, he did so once and for all. We see that in Romans. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. And we also see in Hebrews 2.14 that the power of sin has been broken. Okay, if all those things are true, and obviously they are, then why are we still focused on trying to conquer something that's been conquered? You see, Satan and his evil character of sin is, has been conquered past tense. Colossians 2.15. It has been nailed to the cross in the death of Jesus Christ, wiping out the consequences of sin. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that when you and I give ourselves volitionally to sin, that there aren't consequences. Obviously, they are. But in terms of God, they, these sins have been dealt with, they've been forgiven, and they've been taken out of the way. And so, the person who is legitimately, by faith, received the Spirit of Christ into their human spirit, you, you've been made safe. You've been made safe by the personal presence and the activity of the living Lord Jesus Christ himself. I, so many Christians see themselves separate from Christ. Yes, somehow they believe that Christ lives within me. It, you know, it's kind of like he's in residence, but he's back there somewhere and it's not like a living reality. They, they don't see their union with Christ. And and this is what it means to be in union with Christ. It, it means that we've been freed from sin, and now we're dead to sin, Romans 6.11. And much more, we're not just dead to something, we've been reconciled to God. And as Paul says in Romans 5.10, we've been saved by his life. We're experiencing his life currently. And so neither Satan nor his character of sin has any power over us in this moment. He just doesn't. For the power of sin and death was defeated at the cross once for all. Notice what's missing in our thought process and what's vital for us to begin to appreciate and embrace this this living reality of Jesus, it is the power of God's grace that now has authority over us as Christians. We're, it's not our authority. It's not Satan's authority. It's the authority of Christ himself. And as such, we no longer are under obligation to sin. That's what Paul says in Romans 8, 12. So why are we still focused on it so much? Uh, no, that is not to suggest that, that the believer cannot exercise his freedom of choice to behave in such a way that misrepresents God's character and thus give himself to sinful and selfish character expression of Satan. We still have volitional choice. But to be sin conscious is to miss the living reality of Christ's presence and to be Christ conscious. So Don, as you've been sharing all of this, uh, it's really made some questions kind of pop up in my head and probably for our listeners as well. Um, a few that, that have come to my mind are, uh, so what is the contrast between being sin conscious and Christ conscious? I think we've talked about some of that. Um, and then from there, is the objective of the Christian life to continually be Christ conscious, and what does that look like? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that many struggle with, you know, the contrast, and I think there's some misrepresentations as to, you know, what does it mean to be Christ conscious? So it's a, it's a valid question. Uh, so I would start with kind of a question. Are we as Christians to think of nothing else but Christ? You know, as we go to work, I, I'm a Christian, 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 I'm a Christian. <laughs> It'd be like a mechanic going to, 
to the shop and saying, I'm a mechanic, I'm a mechanic, I'm a mechanic. I, I don't know that I want him working on my car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, for one, do not think that this is practical or what it really means to be Christ conscious. So yes, the Christian should seek to maintain a subconscious awareness of who we are in Christ. We don't want to lose sight of that. I, I, I would kind of illustrate it in a, in a similar kind of way that how a spouse does not lose sight or focus that they are married, even though there are, they're consciously, or, or I should say they're not consciously aware when they're engaged in, let's say, a work task where you know, they, they have to mentally be focused on this task and you know it it requires all of their faculties and uh, their intelligence and their emotions and everything to just be focused on this particular project. Uh, that that mental focus doesn't mean that they're any less married. It's just they're not consciously focused on such. But that doesn't mean that they're engaged in that project as if they're not married. Mm -hmm. You see, so I think that kind of helps to give some context to this. So the Christian is Christ conscious as he or she lives in the reality that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. You see, I, I live in that reality. That is a Christ consciousness. And that, frankly, that I can, at the same time, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. That's Christ consciousness. Uh, the idea that our adequacy is from God, that's Christ consciousness. That, that you and I, ha, as Christians, have been granted everything pertaining to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3, that's Christ consciousness. That makes a lot of sense, Don, and I, I think it, hopefully it'll be helpful for uh, everybody who's who's listening. So then I think from a tangible standpoint, um, the, the next logical question would be, how are we to live being Christ conscious instead of sin conscious? Well, Christ consciousness is by the Spirit's revelation, and frankly, anything relative to the Christian life is by God revealing himself to us and then our willingness to participate with whatever his activity and whatever he's initiating. Um, that is the Christian life, this relationship back and forth where God's the initiator and we're the receiver. So as we come into an awareness of Christ in us, Christ through us, Christ as us, in completeness and perfection, our own spiritual, should I refer to it as our own spiritual status, is no longer kind of at the forefront of our concern. You know, we're not always trying to evaluate where we are spiritually. That's not the primary focus that we have. And, and what, what occurs then from this point on life then kind of refocuses, and it refocuses outward, kind of away from us. It's an others-oriented view. And why is that important? Because this is what Christ consciousness consists of. Uh, think of it, Christ for others through us. God is love. The love is Christ. Christ consciousness is God's love for others. It's not me focused, it's others focused. And so living in Christ consciousness is the awareness of God's abundant spiritual provision, which we have in Jesus Christ. So I would caution, I would say, do not fall for the trap of becoming overly subjective, you know, kind of this mystical, you know, evaluation of who you are spiritually and, you know, kind of overanalyzing whether you are Christ conscious or not. It, it's kind of 
it's kind of like trying to evaluate how humble you believe yourself to be. <laughs> you see, the, the more conscious that you are of having it, that is humility, uh, the less likely is that you do. <laughs> and so we must beware of all forms of spiritual pride and the idea that, you know, we have arrived spiritually or we have, you know, we're not Christ conscious or we are Christ conscious can in and of itself kind of be spiritual pride. So to be Christ conscious is then more likely to be conscious or aware of my own unworthiness and my own inadequacies. Uh, as Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Notice the focus. What's God doing? You know, oftentimes as we're in relationship with God, you know, we have those moments like, oh, Lord, that was pretty neat. You know, that was, that was really you through me. Uh, it's not, it, sometimes we say, well, that wasn't me. Well, obviously it was, but, it, but it's just the Christ you. And the Christ you is always looking good, <laughs> if we could say it that way. And so it might be said that Christ consciousness is more hidden. It's more hidden from our understanding. We do not have to be conscious of what he is doing or how well we are participating with him. It, it's kind of like the Apostle Paul and, and what he said in Romans eleven thirty three. He said, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Now, on the other hand, we can be sure, though, that he is with us always, as Jesus uh, said in Matthew 28, 20. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. And so Christ consciousness versus sin consciousness is really life as God intended. <laughs> so until next time, enjoy your life in Christ. We hope that you were encouraged and blessed by this video. We would love to hear from you and get your feedback and interact. If you have a testimony that relates to today's discussion, please share it below in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click that notification bell so you don't miss any of our broadcasts. Be sure to check out our blog and our website, which is in the description below. And if you'd like to support our work financially, we have also provided the link. And until next time, may you experience life as God intended.